Hello and welcome to Crime Bites, the show where we talk about some truly bizarre and disturbing crime cases. My name is Liz and today is True Crime Tuesday. So this is our last Tuesday in May and do I have a case for you today? So for all you mothers out there, honesty moment, have you ever been tempted to blame something on your child? Maybe you're at a family gathering and you've had one too many of Aunt Ruthie's deviled eggs and you let a real rancid one slide. I'm sorry, but little Mindy here just soiled herself. Whether she did or not, I'm going to go change her. <laughs> Things like that. What about my husband won't divorce me, so my two-year-old shot him in the head? That may be taking it a bit too far, but if you think I've given away the twists before I've even started the story, no, no. Let's start by meeting Sharon. As you can see, she looks like an old-fashioned movie star, and that's because she was born on November 30th of 1939, and obviously she is just lovely. This would come to her advantage throughout her life, as you will see as our story unfolds. She was also apparently very good at telling stories and manipulating people, as you will also see. So, Sharon was a small town girl. She was born and raised in Independence, Missouri, but that did not stop her from having big dreams. When she was 16, she met 22-year-old James at a church function, and Sharon was smitten. The two would start dating, and when James would go back to Brigham Young University to continue his studies, a letter would soon follow that Sharon was pregnant. Upon receiving the letter, James, who was also a devout Mormon, would take leave from college and marry Sharon to make things right. Now, Sharon wasn't planning on living her whole life in Missouri. Remember, she had big dreams. So shortly after their wedding, the couple would move to Utah to attempt to allow James to continue his studies, but that doesn't end up working out, and so the couple soon would move back to Independence, Missouri to take on jobs and attempt to make a go of life together. Sharon would work retail and babysitting gigs while James got a job as an electrical engineer. Sharon would claim to miscarry the child that initiated their marriage, but would actually become pregnant shortly thereafter. And in the fall of 1957, she would give birth to her daughter, Dana. Now, I'm going to describe Sharon as a woman who was not easily satisfied, and she liked to spend the money that she and James made. Purportedly, when shopping was not working and providing enough fulfillment for her, she started turning to other men. And she would end up having a full-on affair with one man in particular named John that she met in high school. She would still go on to have a second child who she would say was James's and they would name him Troy. Now our story starts to take some twists and turns. Sharon decided she wanted out of their marriage and apparently she had an offer for James. She offered that if he paid her a thousand dollars so she could start over, along with allowing her to keep the house and their daughter, he could have their son, then they would have a deal, so to speak. James was on board with this and he suspected that she was unfaithful and was tired of how she was spending their money, but he decided to talk it over with his parents first before he made any rash choices. So the year was 1960 and divorce was not as accepted as it may be now and James's parents were devout Mormons, so they encouraged the couple to do whatever they could to fix their marriage. So with that in mind, James told Sharon that he wanted to work on their marriage and she must have felt that she had no choice but to agree because the couple would stay together. But the happy ending that James was maybe hoping for would not be the one that he would get because on March 19th of 1960, the police would receive a frantic call from Sharon claiming that her daughter had shot her husband. When they arrived, Sharon had been crying and told them that 
she heard the gunshot while she was putting on makeup in the bathroom and an instant before she had heard the gunshot she heard her daughter asking how does it work daddy now this raised some eyebrows and at the time police didn't perform a gunpowder residue test because they were harder to do back then and less reliable they also had little Dana play around with an unloaded gun, and although she didn't actually pull the trigger, she messed around with the safety and was handling it in a manner, I guess, where they thought it could be possible that she accidentally shot her father. Okay. So they ended up buying Sharon's story, and Sharon is able to cash in on James's life insurance policy and carry on with her life. Now, you would think this is a bizarre enough story. Oh, my two-year-old killed my husband, but it does not end there, and it gets even more bizarre as we continue. So about a month after James is dead, Sharon receives the life insurance check, and the first thing she does is goes out and buys her dream car, a powder blue Thunderbird, baby. I love those new ones so much. I get it, Sharon. But at the car lot, those sleek Thunderbirds aren't the only thing that catches Sharon's eye. Mm -mm, because the car salesman, Walter, he was apparently a sight to behold himself. So Sharon kept having little things done to her new car here and there. And soon enough, she and Walter were starting their own affair. Walter was married with children, but that didn't phase Sharon at all. In fact, shortly after they began their affair, she told Walter that she was pregnant and basically demanded that he marry her. He didn't bite at that offer. I mean, he was married with two children already, even though he was cheating. But anyways, two days after he told Sharon he wasn't going to leave his wife and family to marry her, his wife disappears. Now, Walter knew, apparently, and was so sure it was Sharon, he purportedly held a knife to her throat and demanded that she tell him where she was. And Sharon would tell him that she did, in fact, meet with Patricia, his wife, and told her that Walter was having an affair with her sister, who doesn't exist, and that she was sorry, and then told Walter that his wife was probably just devastated and angry and needed some time to cool off. You know, but here I am. Then it gets better. She goes searching for Patricia with her other lover, John, and they find her body. And she was shot four times with a 22 caliber pistol. Now, Sharon didn't want to be involved with the discovery for obvious reasons. So she had John bring her home before going to the police himself. But he did end up telling them that she was with him and that raised a whole bunch of red flags once the various connections were made. So between Sharon having an affair with Patricia's husband and claiming to be pregnant with his baby, and she was pregnant, but she was also claiming it was James's, her late husband's baby, even though the timeline for that didn't add up. So that, admitting to being the last person to seeing her alive, she also had someone buy her another 22 caliber pistol after the one used to kill her husband was confiscated by the police and discovering Patricia's body led to Sharon being charged with both the murders of Patricia and James. Now, because she was pregnant, Sharon got to wait to go to trial until after she had her third child, who she named Marla Christine. So like I said before, Sharon was apparently quite the manipulator, and I don't really know the specifics, but what I can tell you is not only was she acquitted of the murder of Patricia, her lover's wife, but the jury applauded when she was acquitted, and one member even asked for her autograph. After she was acquitted in Patricia's murder, she was tried and found guilty in the murder of her husband, James. So it seemed like she was finally getting some justice. And apparently there's something with applauding juries in Missouri, or she really did have quite the air of drama about her because her jury applauded when she was found guilty in this case as well. However, no one asked her for her autograph. So now Sharon was off to prison. 
Don't leave me yet though, our story isn't over yet. Uh, far from it, in fact. Sharon gets to prison, literally saying that she won't be in there long because she would win on an appeal. And at first her motions were getting denied, but then she was evidently granted a new trial on the basis that her team didn't get enough preemptory challenges when they were selecting the jury. Apparently, during her short time in prison, she is said to have formed a relationship that went as far as a signed handwritten marriage contract with one of her cellmates. And it is said that she basically took over the block that she was held in, whatever that means. So when she was released on bond that her brother paid while awaiting her second trial, she used the information and the connections that she gained in prison to make a life for herself in the mob connected areas of town. It is said that she didn't turn tricks per se, but she did sleep with some of the people with connections in the mob and they would help her out whenever she needed it. So while she was making a life for herself in this manner, fresh out of prison, her second trial for the murder of her husband was declared a mistrial because one of the jurors had retained her prosecutor's partner at one point. So then she had a third trial, which ended in a mistrial because the jury was deadlocked. So a fourth trial was scheduled. Now, the first trial was held in 1962 and the fourth one was scheduled for October of 1964. So things were actually moving along at a fairly steady pace here as far as our legal system goes. But at the same time, so was Sharon. So the summer before her fourth trial, Sharon had found a new lover, Samuel Puligis. I don't know if I'm saying that correctly. Um, anyway, she seemed to realize that her luck was running out in Missouri because she decided to write a series of bad checks and travel to Mexico with Samuel, who she also signed a handwritten marriage contract with. Apparently, she would have been able to leave the country legally with the terms of her bail, but she would have had to have a written consent from the company, which she did not obtain. So she gets to Mexico and at some point goes out for some food or medicine, but ends up at a bar where she meets Francisco Perades Ordonos and goes to a hotel with him where they register as man and wife. Just a few hours later, shots would ring out and when the hotel manager would try and stop Sharon, she would shoot him as well, but he would wrestle the gun from her and hold her for the police. They would find Francisco in the room dead, shot in the heart twice. Sharon would say that this was in self-defense and that she had been sick and had asked Francisco to help her, but he took her to the hotel instead and tried to attack her, so she shot him. The Mexican authorities weren't buying Sharon's stories and they didn't allow for bail for serious crimes like murder, and this left Sharon outraged apparently. It took a year while she waited in jail and she received a 10-year conviction for the murder of Francisco Parades Ordonos. She tried to appeal this charge as well, but they actually raised her sentence to 13 years as a result of her unrepentant attitude. So apparently Sharon was complaining about the prisons at first and when that didn't get her anywhere, she basically took them over as well. It is said that everyone, including the guards, were afraid of her. Then on December 7th of 1969, Sharon disappeared from Altria Ixtapalapa Women's Prison, never to be seen again. The theory is she made it over a wall and met someone on the other side who took her somewhere and she's been laying low ever since, possibly in Guatemala. Another less popular theory is that she was killed in prison and it was covered up by saying that she escaped. She is still known today as La Pistolera.
So Sharon is noteworthy for many reasons, but as a serial killer in particular, because each of her victims was killed basically as a solution to a problem that she had at the time and for no other apparent reason. It seemed that she didn't derive any real pleasure from the act of killing itself, but had no qualms about doing it if it would further an agenda that she had. So that is going to do it for today's story. But as always, let's end today on a more positive note. While doing my research for today's story, I stumbled across this Facebook page and I'll leave a link for it in the description. It's a collection of heartwarming stories and events from Mexico, Missouri. It has things from food pantry to donations, children's centers, and women's organizations that are being done in the community. And it's definitely worth checking out if you would like some uplifting news. Anyways, let me know what you guys think about today's story. It was particularly wild, right? Where do you think Sharon is today and what might she be doing? Part of me wants to picture her out in St. Thomas or something like that with a new identity. Maybe settled down and satisfied not murdering anyone else. Kind of a happy ending, maybe. I don't know. It's probably something wild that would be better than any of us could actually make up though from what we've seen of Miss Sharon. So let me know what you think in the comments below and if you haven't already please be sure to subscribe and stay safe out there. Bye! Mm -hmm.